Well, we're so excited to be here. I mean, we were saying before as we walked in that it's almost better that we got a, a second chance, a second bite at the apple of getting back to White Oak Pastures. We were supposed to do this in September and had to rush off the farm, which is never a good feeling, but it's great to be back and just excited to be able to have a conversation with you. It was good to have you all back. Thank you for coming. Oh, it's amazing. And and we were saying too, when we were staying here last night, there's a little book that you leave for guests. And we didn't realize that you and your wife had actually lived out in the pond house as well in the seventies, right? We did. We lived here in the same house before it was, we, we renovated it. It was, uh, it was pretty rustic in the, <clears throat> it's been very kind. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you, uh, so I'm really interested in the history of this property and, and how you guys got here. How did that, the Harris family get here? Cause it's such an amazing piece of land, and there's so many different types of animals. I think 10 different species of animals. At least, yeah. Yeah. Mm. And then everything, yeah, all the wild uh, yeah. inhabitants as well. So um, we would love to just hear a little bit about the backstory of, of uh, white oak pastures. Sure. So <clears throat> my great-grandfather, James Edward Harris, was raised on a farm about 50 miles from here in Quitman County, Georgia. And I don't know too much about that era. <clears throat> but I do know that when the uh, war broke out in 1861, Civil War, <clears throat> he was a senior at uh, Mercer University in Macon, Georgia. All male mm-hmm. school at that time, 27 people in his class, I'm told. So they quit school and formed a cavalry unit. And they thought they had a deal with the Southern Army, like a band of brothers to be kept together. They thought the war would last six months, and they'd be mm-hmm. right back finishing their education. <clears throat> and uh, the deal they had, they thought they had, is they'd be kept together. But when the when they were at, deployed, the South had a 90% illiteracy rate. Wow. And 27 college boys in one unit. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, they, they uh, just made them officers and mm-hmm. dispersed them. Because they could read. They could mm-hmm. read the orders when they came. Not that they had great leadership tendencies. They could read. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so he fought the war as a cavalry captain. And now this part is what I've always been told. I've never seen it historically, but family law is that at the end of the war, when the South, <clears throat> the, the resources were depleted, uh, young officers were asked to provision their own units if they could financially do so. He had a, the farm in Quitman County, so he mortgaged it and, and uh, uh, provisioned his own cavalry unit for the last months or so of the war, <clears throat> and he was to be paid back when the South won. Of course, it didn't work out like the brochure said, and uh, he was unable to pay the bank, so the bank took that farm. Uh, he was fortunate he had an uncle who was a medical doctor in Bluffton, which is about three miles that way, Dr. Carter, who started him over here on this farm mm. financially. And uh, he farmed the land. <clears throat> and uh, my grandfather, Will Carter, he was, he, he, that was James Edward Harris, my great-grandfather. His son, my grandfather, Will Carter Harris, ran the farm and added to it. His son, my father, Will Bell Harris, added to it. Uh, I'm Will Harris, no middle initial, and, uh, uh, and I've added to it. So that's the that's the history. Beautiful. And you went to the University of Georgia with the intention to go to school and come back and run the farm. Is that correct? Correct. correct. I, you know, I, <clears throat> growing up, I never wanted to do anything but run this farm. Mm. When my my friends wanted to be uh, firemen and baseball players and whatever else little, what little boys want to be, I just want to come home and run the farm. Mm-hmm. And I went to the University of Georgia, <clears throat> majored in animal science, came back and joined my father, who was a very, very industrial cattleman and, and successful. Mm. And... Uh, uh, initially with him and later without him, I ran the farm very industrially for about 20 years. Mm. Was What were those early conversations like between you and him about starting to change some of the practices? Because I think you've, you've been uh, outspoken about kind of that transition and going from conventional to a more regenerative model, which we can dive into a little bit. But um, I imagine those first few conversations with him were 
maybe a little bit contentious? Or <clears throat> no, just... actually, we never had them. Really? Uh, he, he would not have allowed it. Mm. Uh, my dad literally died of dementia. And uh, by the time I wanted to do it differently, he was not in the conversation. So, and uh, and I, 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 I have no siblings. And my wife has never been active in the business. So I didn't have to convince anybody but me. Mm. And if I had, I probably couldn't have done it. Mm-hmm. You know, they, 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 there was, you know, there was not much, uh, much compelling financial evidence that I it was the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. So that was very fortunate in that way. What, what convinced you to start having some of those thoughts around changing things? <clears throat> you know, it, it happened very organically. A little, little low, not or, not yesterday, <laughs> yeah. not very organically. Uh, my, uh, I, you know, I was, I was financially successful, uh, managing the farm industrially and we weren't rich people, but we lived very comfortably and I never lost money any year operating industrially. I, I, I went back and I pay taxes every single year. Uh, but I was enjoying it less and less. You know, the, the, the things that were really cool to me when I was in my 20s and 30s were less cool to me in my 40s. The, uh, the use of pesticides, chemical fertilizers, some therapeutic antibiotics, hormone implants, steroids, uh, <clears throat> were uh, increasingly I was aware of the unintended consequences. I, you know, I, I started looking past the short-term initial benefit of using that technology and, and didn't like what I saw. Uh, the, the, the unintended consequences were very unseen, unnoticed consequences. Mm-hmm. It took a long time to say, hmm, that's, that's, that's not good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I would imagine it's interesting being a farmer in 2022 because with the power of the internet, there are so many other regenerative farms that you can discover and find out about and look to see the practices that they're implementing. Obviously, it wasn't the same way in the 90s. So I'm just curious, did you come across any other farms that were doing things in a regenerative way? Or I don't know if there were any farms that served as an inspiration to you that this alternative way could could potentially be possible. The, the, you know, there were not because I didn't, I mean, if there were, <clears throat> well, in retrospect, I guess there was. I didn't know. Them. You know, this is in the uh, in the mid nineties. You know, we didn't have internet down here. Mm-hmm. You know, if you didn't read it in the paper, you know, you, you didn't know what was happening. And when I started doing this, I just assumed I was the only person doing it. I was not, but I thought I was. You know, my best friend was a guy named Gabe Brown from Bismarck, North Dakota, who's great. And we talk, and he started doing the same thing I did about the same time I did, Mm -hmm. but in Bismarck, North Dakota. You know, it's the other side of the world. And uh, uh, our our evolution is similar, but but different. But uh, it's it's, it's very interesting. You know, today we uh, we go to conferences. We see these thirty year old people talking about their journey and. In regenerative, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we go, where the fuck was he in that? <laughs> not born yet. <laughs> in, 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 the second, in the second grade, yeah. uh, not born yet. But it's, it's, it's interesting. And there, you know, there are a lot of people making great progress with this today. And there were a few people making some progress 25 years ago. We just mm. didn't know each other. And there was no, no way of really connecting, especially if you don't know they're out there. 100%. Yeah. How, um, uh, season to season, how did you guys start to realize that this was the right path? Because one of the things, and I'm, I'm no farmer, but making changes on a farm seems like it's probably a hard thing to do, uh, especially over a, a long enough period of time. So how do you know you're making the right change? <clears throat> Very intuitive, you know, especially initially. Initially, it's intuitive. Let's do it like that. So, right. you know, you're right. Uh, making a change in any established business is hard. I mean, it's, it's working. Yeah. Leave it alone. Mm. So, but uh, <clears throat> you know, the dissatisfaction of that system, that production system, caused me to want to make the changes. And the changes I made were basically giving up things I didn't like. I, I never sat down and wrote up a plan of getting from there to here. That, that didn't happen. 
And the reasons were not, yeah, you, know, you can bet that in 1995, a 40-year-old Will Harris didn't walk outside and say, I believe the climate's changing. <laughs> and I think I can help mitigate that. Yeah. <laughs> that shit didn't happen. Mm-mm. It wasn't like that. I just didn't like what I saw here on the ground. Mm-hmm. And it didn't, it wasn't rocket science to figure out what was doing it. I mean, if it's something I don't like is happening here in this field, and it's not like that over there in those woods. What's the difference? Tillage, chemical fertilizer, pesticides. So give up the chemicals, chemical fertilizer, pesticides. You can give that up. You can give, you leave those things. And when I did, so that, that part was easy. The hard part is that when I did, there was like a withdrawal mm. in which things aren't good and productivity falls. <clears throat> it starts to come back up, right? But it's a period of time, and when you're during that period of time and you don't know, you fall on you, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. But it didn't. Yeah. And your dad has, I think you said that your your father had interesting memories in the late '40s, early '50s of these chemical fertilizer salesmen that are coming out, and they would get people together in barbecues and yeah. try and get you all to believe that. The synthetic route was the the route that you should be taking, right? Yeah, yeah what you said is exactly right. But they weren't; they were, those guys weren't tricking anybody. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just looked great. I mean, it looked like like magic. You know, like magic, right? And uh, who 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 could not pile in on that? And virtually everybody did. I mean, there might have been a holdout somewhere, but pretty much the the entire food production system embrace those technologies that were magic in terms of production, but has such horrible unintended consequences mm. that you couldn't see them. Mm. So, and then to, even today, 95% of the food in this country, <clears throat> maybe more, is produced industrially. Yeah. And, you know, the, and now we know about the unintended consequences. It's hard to make yourself see them. If that's what you do, <clears throat> you know, the, you know, the hardest person to convince that something's wrong is the guy that's making his living at it. Let's take a minute to talk about some of the sponsors and brands who support the show. What are you thinking? I was thinking about Carnivore Bar. What, what are your thoughts on Carnivore Bar? I mean, it's unbelievable. It's an unbelievable product. We were lucky enough to have the founder, Philip Meese, on the show a few months ago, and he was able to send us a bunch of product when we started the relationship and absolutely loved it. I mean, you know, it's minimum ingredient product, beef, tallow, salt. And then they do have a honey flavored option as well, but it's so nice to have a bar that's like three to four ingredients. And like when you're following a carnivore diet, it's really tough to find products that are in line with that specific diet, you know? Yeah, for me, it kind of hits like the holy trinity of what you're looking for when you're looking for food. So it's nutrient dense, it's convenient, and it tastes great. And as you said, most people who are trying to eat healthy, the convenience factor is kind of a, a, a tough part. So just being able to have something you can grab on the go know that you're going to have that nutrition for the day. It's huge. Yeah. And we, we were lucky enough. We got to actually see their factory too in Missouri and they're just doing things the right way. I love how they offer an option for like carnivore purists where it's just beef, tallow, salt. And then they also have an animal based option too. If you do want a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of variety, they have a honey in that option. And they're just people that are doing things the right way. They're very mission focused. They're carnivores themselves. And, you know, we're always on the go. We're traveling. We've taken a bunch of flights together to have a bar that has 30 grams of fat too, like that's huge from an energy density standpoint, right? Yeah, he checks all the boxes or the company checks all the boxes. And I just think the fact that they're sourcing from a regenerative farm as well and Joyce Farms, just a win-win. 100%. The Carnivore Bar. So we got the affiliate link and then it's code MAFIA for 10% off. And then another one of our sponsors, one of our favorite farms, Holy Cow. What, the, what they're doing uh, at Holy Cow is, is pretty remarkable. The relationships that they've built uh, in the industry and how long they've been doing the grass-fed, grass-finished, regenerative model is really uh, innovative. Uh, they were one of the first people um, to be doing that and supplying Whole Foods early on. Uh, just a, a, a great uh, community farm and also just product is something that speaks for itself. Yeah, I think number one, to your point, Harry, they're just incredible people. We got to hear them speak at the Beef Initiative Conference in Colorado. We had never met them before, but just hearing Warren's story where they were following a standard American diet, 
he had had a heart attack and they were just looking for answers of like, how can we actually get healthier? Do I need to be dependent on medication? And they started changing their diets to incorporating more animal foods. And he completely reversed those symptoms of his stroke. And now they're just doing things the right way. They're, they're grass finishing their beef. They're incorporating incredible practices. They have great relationships with the animals and they're very passionate about just like connecting directly with the customer and also educating their customer on grass finished beef. Yeah. And I think the best part is too, they're shipping nationally and trying to reach a bigger audience. So being able to not only supply beef nationally, but also educate people on the, the quality of good, clean, whole foods is just, it's an incredible mission. How much do you love their beef bacon, by the way? I know that's your go-to. It's one of the best things I've ever tasted. <laughs> it's that good. No, honest to God, it's so good. Holy cow. Yeah. One of the other farms that supports us is Perennial Pastures, another regenerative farm out of San Diego. Our experience with Kevin Munya, the owner, we had him on the show, a young first-generation rancher who's really empowered by this movement of regenerative agriculture and really wants to be a leader in the space. I think our conversation with him was so insightful just in terms of how mission-focused he is and how he really thinks about his farm as a business and wanting it to be here 50, 100 years down the road, even though he's just the first generation of it. And I think just being able to spend time with him out in San Diego was kind of the perfect indication of that, where we got to go have a meal with him at his house, hang out with his wife and kids. Like, what an amazing person. And I think his mission focus around raising really high quality beef and restoring nutrients to the soil is just one of, one of those rare missions that I think everyone can get around. Yeah, he has such a commitment to really feeding the local community in San Diego, in the San Diego County, first and foremost. But he's also passionate about feeding the community around the country. So I know they've invested a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of resources to being able to order beef in bulk on their website. So I know I know that they now offer quarter, half, whole cows directly, directly off the website. Um, they have that great ancestral blend ground beef product. So it actually has organ grinds uh, mixed into the ground beef. So you're getting the benefits of like an ounce or so of organ meat. But because it's in the ground beef, you really can't taste it at all. And I think to your point, Harry, just in a, another amazing person, you know, he, Kev was someone that he was following a paleo diet in college and started realizing, wow, when I nourish my body with real foods, I feel amazing, had a really successful stint in tech, but realized that there was just something else that he was passionate about. So he's one of those rare cases where, you know, he put his money where his mouth is and he's a first generation farmer, just, you know, bootstrapping this thing raising money and just so passionate about feeding the community. Just an amazing guy. Yeah, absolutely. What are your thoughts on organ supplements? And what do you think about the company that supports our podcast, Optimal Carnivore? Such a good question, man. I think organ meat is something that's gained a ton of notoriety the last few years. And for good reason, um, I don't want to speak for you, but I think both of us have had a ton of benefits just incorporating organ meats into our diet. I would say that you know, we definitely prefer the raw source of organs where we'll just, you know, chop up some liver and some heart and, you know, there are different ways to prepare it. I think the raw source is the most nutrient dense, but, you know, we're fortunate that there are companies like Optimal Carnivore that exist that freeze dry organ capsules. So you can actually take them on the go. You know, there, there are a ton of times where we're traveling where we're not going to have access to, to raw organs. So we can just, I can throw a little Ziploc bag together of, of Optimal Carnivore and be good to go. And I think six pills is an ounce of organs, which is like the daily recommended amount that will give you a lot of those really good quality vitamins in there. Um, so that's kind of how I think we've been using it. What, am I, did I miss anything there? No, I, I think the, the fact that it, it just makes organs accessible to people. And I think that organs are generally just a food group that are underutilized when it comes to eating nose to tail. And the nature's vitamin is a perfect name for these organ uh foods and i think a lot of people are pretty um you know in the mainstream object to eating uh organ meats but when you put it in a pill form that's doesn't taste bad it's convenient you can put it in your backpack um it makes things a lot easier and i also think that just generally these brands are optimal carnivore is focused on making people healthier which is just a, such a strong mission and um you know, I think liver capsules is a great way to get people thinking about their health differently. hundred percent. There's, there's probably someone that's listening to this right now 
and you're interested in organ meats, but the taste might make you a bit squeamish. You feel strange about eating raw foods. Maybe you cook liver and you don't like it. Maybe it has a metallic taste. I think that's also where the organ capsules play such a great role is that you're still getting that nutrient density, but you're getting it in a very convenient capsule like format. And it just takes away any of that squeamishness that you might have to the taste. It's, you know, it's just a great product. And also Richard who runs Optimal Carnivore, you know, he's, he's started listening to the show really early on and he's built his own organ supply chain and is just doing things the right way and really trying to support the right people in the space. So just proud to be associated with them, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for listening. Now we're going to go back to the show. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard to make a change if you're making money. Yeah. And I think in other areas, to, not just farming, it's breaking these paradigms down and trying to recreate something different. It's, it takes people like yourself and Gabe Brown, who I think have put out some of the best information on this stuff. I know your blog is a tremendous resource for people. Gabe Brown's book, Dirt to Soil is- Gabe's great. <clears throat> Gabe, <clears throat> he's my friend. But, and, and I, I, I tell him, he's, he's the second best regenerative farmer I know. And, and modesty pre preempts me from saying, who, who, <laughs> but Gabe, and Gabe's fantastic, couldn't be better. And he is so good at telling the story. <clears throat> Gabe is a born teacher. Yeah. And he can just start here and just take it right on down the line mm. in a manner where people who are not part of this industry can appreciate it and enjoy it. And I, I, that's, that's, that's not my skill set. You know, my my. He's he's very linear in the way he thinks. I'm very uh, cyclical. You know, I'm, I'm all over the board. I, you know, I, I, I'm presenting is not my strong suit because I get, I go down a rabbit hole and I, I meant to tell you something but I didn't. And, <laughs> but I told you the other twice. Yes, <laughs> because uh, you get passionate about it. Right? Yeah, right, right. Well, the passions are in both in both cases. But your farm tours are some of the most educational and and i think well-told stories uh i know we did one in september it was amazing just seeing you speak to what's happening on your property i, I, I feel good about <clears throat> talking about what we do when i'm here doing it yeah not not not, not, not so much powerpoint yeah but, yeah uh in fact we uh we formed a non-profit last year 501c3 called center for agro Agricultural Resilience, CIFAR, Center for Agricultural Resilience. And uh, I insisted on center because I mean, we're not, I'm not going to the Holiday Inn by the airport and teach people what we do. Yeah. You, know, you need to come here. I, I won't be effective at the Holiday Inn by the airport. Right. <clears throat> I'm, I, I think I do a good job here where I can show you and discuss it with you. So that's, that's my contribution. Mm -hmm. To, to help and move the needle. I've heard you say before that everything you're doing at White Oak is your contribution to the local community feeding Bluffton, the neighboring counties, and that 501C that you'd mentioned, the Center for Agricultural Resilience, that's your contribution to create a system to maybe save the world ultimately. Yeah. And, you know, I, I see so many <clears throat> people in this space who are frustrated and unhappy because they're trying to save the world. And I'm, I'm the happiest man I know <laughs> because I'm, I'm not trying to save the world. I'm trying to save white oak pastures. Mm. Now, if I can contribute to saving the world by showing people what we know, <clears throat> I'm happy to do that. You know, we, mm. we, we paid for the formation of that, that nonprofit. That's my contribution towards helping other people. Mm. But I'm not going to the Holiday Inn by the airport. Yeah. Do, do you think there's further evolutions down this regenerative model for white oak to make? And I guess that question is kind of based out of, um, you know, we're all, or we're all kind of learning this new model of agriculture and you've been doing it for years, but are there other things that you're thinking about? Oh, hell yeah. I mean, we're not there yet. It's a journey. Right. <clears throat> and we're still figuring it out. You know, this we, we call this biomimicry, the emulation of nature. And it is so imperfect. So imperfect. I mean, we get better and better at it. I and mean, I can tell year to year <clears throat> the things we've gotten better at. And, and and I think that'll be true when my children and grandchildren are doing it. What are the things that you think your farm does a very good job of? And what are the areas of improvement to Harry's point that you still think you guys could be getting better at over time? That's good. 
<clears throat> so there are, three, there are three things that we think we do well. Only three. <clears throat> Very limited. <clears throat> I'm a one-trick pony. <laughs> this is my trick. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the, the regeneration of the land, which to me is the restarting of the cycles of nature, mm. is, is one of the things. And that's, you know, the industrial agriculture breaks the cycles of nature. Regenerative land management restarts the cycles of nature. We can talk a lot about that. Mm. <clears throat> the next one is uh, animal welfare. You know, we... Uh, uh, we do raise 10 species of livestock. <clears throat> but, you know, there's, there's wildlife, there are bees, there are working animals, companion animals, uh, on and on, microbes in the soil. <clears throat> and all of these creatures have instinctive behaviors. And the linear industrial model breaks those... those it, it, <clears throat> The animal, it does not allow the animal to express instinctive behaviors. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we think we're pretty good at that. You know, perfect. Mm -hmm. Pretty good. And, and those two, the land and the animals, that was very intentional. You know, we, we, I spent a lot of time, later we spent a lot of time studying what we were doing, what we ought to be doing, what we could be doing, and, and really tried hard, you know, implemented things. Some worked, some didn't. What didn't work, we mm. re-implemented. Mm. Maybe it worked, did not. We re-implemented. The third thing that we think we're good at is community building. And that's interesting to me in that we never intentionally worked on that. And we, we worked on the land and the animals because that's, that's what we thought we could make a contribution at. And in doing that, kind of looked up one day and said, damn, this is nice. The community is nice. You know, Bluffton, Georgia, in the middle, which is in the middle of this farm, <clears throat> the very geographic center, uh, was was a ghost town. I can tell you the story, but it had it was a thriving little uh, agricultural community, purely agrarian economy, from 1815 to that World War II period. Since then, it's just been in decline. And the reason is because the, that centralized model makes uh, agrarian economies, small rural towns, uh, irrelevant mm. and economically irrelevant. <clears throat> so they starve financially. So by the time I started making my change, Bluffton was a ghost town. The only thing you could buy in Bluffton was a stamp. And was, you had to be damn careful when you went to buy the stamp because the post office wasn't open much. <laughs> <clears throat> Today, it's, it's a little destination. You, you guys, this is your second trip. Absolutely, you know, incredible. You know, it's not. You know, Disney World does not have to worry about us. We'll, they'll be fine. <laughs> yes, but people choose to come here. You know, and we, and it's because White Oak Pastures made the town economically relevant again. Mm. When I was farming industrially, I had about three minimum wage employees, payroll about a thousand dollars a week. And today, you know, we got 180 something employees, payrolls over a hundred thousand dollars a week, and a lot of those people are <clears throat> sophisticated people. I got employees; I pay more than I pay myself and my children. Hmm. So, they came here to work here. Yeah, for all the skill set. Wow. And they needed a place to eat and sleep and play and drink and work and shop, and we provided it. And Suddenly, it's a nice little town. Mm. Do you think this system of reliance is kind of at the core of the community that you've built here? And I just ask that because it seems like it's this community is such a juxtaposition to what you see if you go to any like urban or suburban area where people are really not as reliant on each other in a, a really close, meaningful way. <clears throat> That's interesting. And reliance is not a word that I have used, but I get it. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> you know, it's a, uh, in my, uh, maybe, not, maybe the way I would say that is <clears throat> it's a real uh, step backwards in sense of community. You know, I've, you know, we've all heard people, you've probably experienced it. Hell, I, I've experienced it where you lived in, in the city yeah. 
You didn't know who lived over there. <laughs> You've been living here a long time. They've been living there a long mm. time. You know what they look like. You don't know those people. Mm. Here, uh, we live together. We don't just live beside each other. So uh, uh, I think that sense of community uh, comes from, reliance is probably a good word, comes from just <clears throat> interacting with each other, not just ha- living beside each other. Right. Or in spite of each other. Right. I mean, how special of a feeling is that for you, just seeing everything that's happened to the town over the last 30 years since you've been implementing some of these changes? Well, the best part of it for me is <clears throat> it's, it brought two of my three children back. Mm. And they had, uh, they, between them, they've had five grandchildren who are the sixth generation on the farm. And they wouldn't have come back here if, it, if we hadn't done things differently. I didn't. I didn't do it for that purpose, but that's the greatest purpose it served. Yeah. You know, when my children, my children called this to my attention, when they were growing up, they were just about the only children in Bluffton of that age. And today, all these people, all, all these young people got one or two or three children. You know, if not, they're still kids themselves, so they're out playing, you know, there. <laughs> do you ever think about what the community would look like if you had continued down that industrial path well you can go see it i mean any of these little towns around here you know it's it's continued decline <clears throat> bluffton georgia uh, uh organized uh, uh, the city what's the right word organized uh chartered city mm-hmm. yeah uh, east of the mississippi zero new housing starts from 1972 to 2016 was that 40 years, 40 mm-hmm. something years? Yeah, just about. Uh, inco- incorporate is the word I was looking for. Yeah, incorporate, incorporate the city, east of the Mississippi, zero new housing starts. I don't know how many houses were torn down during that period. And what happened was because there's no jobs, no economy, people moved somewhere else and the house sat there and it would be inhabited by, poor, by some poor person. They couldn't live anywhere else for the most part. Not 100%, but a huge percent. And they, they'd live there. They would, didn't have any money to spend on the house. The house would become unlivable. It'd be torn down. So Bluffton is full of old house seats that, that don't, don't have houses mm-hmm. anymore. Uh, in 2016, two of my directors built really nice homes in Bluffton. Uh, we bought a lot of houses in Bluffton and fixed them up. So it's a little, it's a little town again. It's incredible. I mean, it's something that we saw when we were, because we were in Texas, so we made the road trip out here. So we drove through Mississippi, through Alabama, through Georgia. And that was one of the things that we were commenting on is that you would see these towns where the buildings were probably beautiful maybe 20, 30 plus years ago, and they're they're now just dilapidated and you you're saying that this has so much potential to be an incredible downtown or a community, but I, probably through some of those practices, people have just left and there's not much opportunity there anymore. And that is purely, because I believe that I can tell you, that's purely a situation where <clears throat> the agrarian, the more agrarian the economy was, mm. the, the greater the uh, failure of the economy. Wow. Mm. Bluffton is an extreme example. Never had a railroad. Never had a factory, never had a mill, purely agrarian economy. Mm. So it was most devastating. But the spectrum goes, you know, and, and, and I don't know of any of these agrarian economies that have gone into failure <clears throat> that came back because of agriculture. Some mm. of them came back because of tourism or because of something. Mm. But uh, the girl that brought Bluffton to the party, which is farming it brought Bluffton back to the party. Mm. And that could happen. There's nothing unique about us here. That could happen in every agricultural county in the country. And it should. There should be a, a white oak pastures of some sort mm-hmm. in every agricultural county in the country. Mm-hmm. Should be. <clears throat> and our model here is scalable only by being replicatable. For us to scale up like a linear big ag, big food, 
company yeah. is not in the cars. That's not that, that's not meant to be that way. Yeah, it's cyclical, not linear. So it doesn't need to scale up. It needs to replicate. Mm-hmm. Part of the reason why both Harry and I have been asking you questions about community is we have an interesting, almost um, almost like an opposite perspective where Harry's from Virginia. I'm from New Jersey. I was living in New York City for a few years. He was living in Boston, two major Northeast metropolitan cities. And there is no connection to the local farmer or rancher. And what I mean by that is we both went down this path because we were trying to cure some health issues through diet which we had talked a little bit about in September. We had gone carnivore, animal-based, eating a lot of animal protein, and that led us down towards wanting to connect with our local rancher. And I remember the first time I heard about that concept of shaking your rancher's hand. I was like, where the hell do I find a rancher? I don't even know where to start. So it's interesting, but that's what the mindset is in some of these major cities. So it's amazing to see the contrast down here where you it's not bluffed in White Oak. It's, it's one community and people have a relationship with you, and they know that you're going to take amazing care of the animals and nourish them with the best quality animal protein. And, you know, I'll, I'll go out on a limb here and say I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't, I don't believe all these things I <clears throat> hear people talk about. But I do rail against the impact of big ag and big food. And who's, whose best interest is it in for you people in – New Jersey or, or Boston to not know farmers. It's in big big foods interest. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, they 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 buy food from farmers at very, very, very cheap prices. Mm-hmm. And they, they they do some things now. They they, they they aggregate and further process and, and then sell it to consumers. And there's a lot of money in that transaction. And, and when you look at, uh, you know, you say we've all seen online those uh, gr- graphics of the big food companies, Coca Cola, PepsiCo, Net, Net, you know, all the big food companies that own the whole food system, and and we all know what incredibly, not just nationally but internationally powerful financial. Uh, monsters that is created in mm-hmm. a short time. Yes, that's eighty years maybe. So, you know, it's the farmer has uh, been impoverished by uh, the, the that system. I just got me sure talking about that, right? Oh yeah. And then the the consumer is eating uh, probably less well than they should. That's what you guys talk about for a living. Yes. Yeah. So. And, and then there's big multinational publicly traded companies getting rich between those two. Right. Yeah. It's, it's an efficient system to make those big companies profitable. What's, what's your interpretation of the history there on how all of that transpired from a farming perspective? And I, I say that as in the concentration of power into so many or so, sorry, so few big multinational companies. Okay. <clears throat> so three things happened post World War II to the food system, and this, this is going to be kind of a long story. Oh, we're ready. We love it. <laughs> three things happened: industrialized, commoditized, and centralized. So let's just break them down, and, and they're, they're all related, but they're, they're very separate. So the the industrialization that is changing the farm uh, from a very cyclical living system to a very linear industrial system, mm-hmm. factory farm. You know, big ag just <laughs> nuts up at the, at the term factory farm. And that's because it's so accurate. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we, we took that very linear. Uh, so, okay, so let's, let's bring it a little further. So there, there, we talk a lot about a complicated system on a complex system. A complicated system is linear. This this computer device we're talking on here is very complicated. A lot going on to make it work. And if one component fails, it's not going to work anymore. Yeah. A complex system is like your body or this farm. Living system. Complex. 
a lot going on to make it work. Right. But if one component fails, it morphs and continues to operate. So reductionist science works incredibly well on these linear, complicated mm. systems. Put a man on the moon. <laughs> you know, you, the whole internet, you know, just all these things. Factories, factories are so incredible, so efficient, so scaled up. That doesn't work in a living system. Mm. Living systems are, are complex. Uh, they they, they uh, replicate, but they don't scale up. Uh, you know, what got us here is that incredible linear scaling up in the factory farm uh, generated just unbelievable efficiencies that took incredible cost out of the production of food, but it left unintended consequences that fell on the backs of the land, the animals, community. So that, and it broke, and it did that by breaking the cycles of nature. We'll talk about mm. that later. Mm. All right, so that is the industrialization. The commoditization. That's the second one. Mm. Uh, there was a time in that when farmers and, and, pe and people interacted that farmers were you know, uh, monetarily benefited by being the best. You know, if I, if I was a tomato farmer, I want to raise the best freaking tomatoes in the state. Not you know, partly because of pride of ownership, pride of you know hubris, but also because if I raised the best tomatoes and everybody thought Will Harris tomatoes were better than everybody else, I could get a premium for them. Mm -hmm. and I was financially rewarded by putting as much value as I could in the product, whether it was tomatoes or cows or hogs or oranges or pecans or what of avocado don't matter. Then we commoditized. That, that we did that so we could big companies could pool products for efficiency. And when we did that, we set minimum standards. So all of a sudden, it's not about making your product the best it can be. It's a race to the bottom to make it as cheap as you can, to put as little value as you can, because you're not going to get compensated for it. Mm. The monetization's not there. So that's commoditization. So industrialization hurt the land, the water, the climate. Commoditization hurt the food. And the last one is centralization. Right? Where you right? And that's what destroyed rural America. That's when we moved the cattle slaughter to the Midwest, now this far west. When we moved the vegetable production to California, the Central Valley. When we moved, you know. We centralized everything, and we shipped just raw materials from rural America. So there's no monetization there. So those three things are what got us here, and it's what you described when you said in New Jersey you didn't know your people, and in Boston you didn't know your people. Mm. It's in it's in Big Ag's best interest to keep to keep them separate. Mm. Big Big Foods best interest. The, the commoditization point is so interesting because I think you you see this in a lot of different areas when it comes to the food system but uh, like from the nutrition perspective there's a lot of arguments around well is like grass fed more healthy for you than grain fed and you kind of get down these weird arguments about like almost over sciencing some parts of this uh, like the carbon the carbon cycle trying to measure the carbon I imagine someone like you can figure out how how the organic matter in the soil, is doing compared to last year pretty easily, but people are looking for a scientific study to figure out why that is. And it almost plays into the commoditization of the, the products because you need someone with an authority to tell you whether or not, you know, this, uh, this product is as good as it is um, as, as opposed to people just going based on consumer taste or preference. Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I, in marketing our product, yeah, I had my my daughter handles our marketing. I handled out her. I had made some pretty stupid statements as a, when I first started. You know, I'd I'd hear some nutritionists say that uh, grass fed beef had more conjugated linoleic acid than grain fed beef. So I'd proudly state that, and I realized how stupid I sound. 
talking about something, you know, what I know about omega threes and omega sixes and conjugated mm-hmm. lipolytic acid and all that. You know, it just sounds stupid because you're just parroting what somebody else has said. And I had her go through our website and remove everything. This is years ago. Everything that talked about nutrient density, health, safety, culinary taste. Don't don't put that in there. I I, I believe a lot of it. Mm-hmm. I think I think a lot of it's true, but I'm not the authority. I am the authority on animal welfare, land stewardship, and community building. Mm. So that's what we talk about. And you know, I think I think our food tastes pretty good, but uh, you know, f- fair trade coffee, what you call it? Yeah. All right. Yeah. It don't taste any better than regular, uh, not fair trade coffee. You know, people pay more for it to support a system they believe in, and I can talk about that as an authority. Mm. You know, I, I can't talk about these other things. Luckily, we got people like y'all that will talk about it for us. You know, Donna Rogers and all those you know people that can speak as authorities on those subjects. It's a great point, and it's something that Harry and I spent a lot of time thinking about because we've had on a whole different variety of guests, and there's some guests that are all in on the grass-fed, grass-finished. There's some people that just want to direct you towards eating more animal products, and then you also have people that are in these wars of, carnivore and animal products versus veganism. And we're just trying to focus on getting people to connect with local farmers and just eat real food grown from the ground, whether that's um, meat, fish, eggs, dairy, fruits, vegetables. And you kind of use your own determination to figure out what ratios of those foods make the most sense, but just try and push people towards that more direct uh, sourcing of their food. Well, and that's, that's a constant. The others are moving targets. Yeah. But, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> it's hard. It's so, it needs talking about a lot because it is so hard. You know, I, I, uh, you know, because we were early at this party, uh, when the certifications came out, I can remember saying, oh, hell yeah, this is great. Mm-hmm. You know, I can get certified by whoever, and then I don't have to go through. I don't have to go tell people why it's better. I mean, I, that that'll be done for me. And 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 I I bet you I've had just about every certification that you can have from certified organic, certified humane, uh, GAP Step Five Plus, uh, on and on. All you know, all of them. I, I can't. Not many we hadn't had. And I did that. And I thought I thought about like Boy Scout merit badges. Yes. <laughs> You know, the more I had, the more value I could demonstrate was in my product. And it, that didn't work out. You know, uh, green washing came about and certifications were formed that was just really low hanging fruit that, uh, and then conf- consumers got hopelessly confused. And that now, if consumers go to the store and say, I, I, oh, hell, they're all certified. This is fine. <sighs> So mm-hmm. that that didn't work. Right. Sadly, that didn't work. Yeah. Uh, certifying became a cottage industry, and so uh, so you can't depend on certification. You can't depend on. You certainly can't depend on USDA labeling. I mean, it, it is legally fraudulent. You know, you can go to the grocery store and buy beef, product of the USA, that was born, slaughtered in Uruguay or Australia or New Zealand, but it's product of the USA. The animal never drew a breath of air in the USA. Uh, we certainly can't depend on the advertising. You know, any, uh, you know, whether it's sustainable, organic, regenerative, resilient, if we, if, if we farmers come up with it today, the big food companies will have it emblazoned in pretty colors tomorrow. Hundred mm-hmm. percent, and you have such an interesting perspective because you've sold you've sold grass finished beef to Whole Foods for over twenty years, correct? We do. So you've seen the whole um, progression of of labeling and greenwashing, and us living in Austin now, we had heard that there was a time period early on in Whole Foods when you would go there 
and there would be butchers and different people that worked there that were incredibly knowledgeable and could tell you exactly where the cow came from, how they were raised, where they grass fed versus, uh, you know, grain finished. Um, and now you go to Whole Foods and there's really no way to verify at all. Sometimes I'll just go there for the heck of it and just talk, to, ask the butcher just to see what their level of knowledge is. And some of them, like at best, they can tell you the farm that it came from. But I, I've never had someone that can verify whether it's actually grass finished beef. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a sad story. And uh, I, I sold Whole Foods Market the first pound, the first pound of American grass fed beef that they marketed as American grass fed beef nearly 20 years ago. Like I'd have to go back and look, but it probably in the early 2000s. And, uh, and they, they had, Pictures of me and the farm on the wall up there, and, and uh, you know, it was it was a uh, ego boost, but it also the farm the, the and, I, and uh, part of my agreement was that me or somebody would go to every Whole Foods that had my beef and explain the process to the people behind the counter. So I, and I did that. Mm -hmm. I've been to. At one time, my grass-fed beef was sold at every freaking Whole Foods from Miami to Princeton, New Jersey to Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, and and it was, they were just about my only customer. Mm. So I, I sold them in Publix, the only two customers mm. I had. And now we're, you know, we, I doubt if we stay in Whole Foods very much longer. Mm. It wow. probably won't be my choice, but, mm. you know, I, I'm not agonizing over it. Because it's, it just, I, 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 it hadn't. It hadn't been going in a good direction for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm from Princeton. So I remember they opened up a Whole Foods. It was like 2005 or 2006. I've been to it. There you go. <laughs> so I, we probably. So I'm I'm assuming early on there that that was your beef then that they were having behind the counter. If it was grass fed beef in 2005 in Princeton, New Jersey. It was mm -hmm. mine. Wow. wow. I just about got arrested in Princeton, New Jersey <laughs> because I didn't understand those jug handles. Oh right? yeah. And. You're like, what the heck is this? I've never seen this yeah, before. I, I, Can't I, just make a left. You got to go around. And, yeah. And the New Jersey State Patrolman <laughs> that, that, that blue lighted me when I did it was such an asshole. <laughs> he said, he said, uh, he, I handed him a driver's license and he looked, he, and he blue lighted me, sat there and looked at my tag. I guess he was checking me out. <laughs> Georgia on my, on my Jeep. Mm -hmm. right? Came up the side and I handed him my license. I had it ready for him. George, to, he looked at it and he said, so where are you from? <laughs> <laughs> I said, you know, a Georgia State Patrolman would not have asked me that. Yeah. yeah. He went down here from there. <laughs> yeah. People are much nicer down here for sure. Yeah. yeah. A little bit of that Southern hospitality. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I, uh, we, I've been to that, print, that, I've been to all the Whole Foods that were open during that era. Got it. Uh, well, you, you, uh, you talked a little bit about the labeling of grass-fed beef. Is there a way to fix the labeling laws? Because, like, I kind of understand part of the, the problem. It's like you need to have some level of education for the consumer or maybe, like, some level of security or protection for them to know what they're getting and know that it's high quality. But then from your perspective, it's like I can't market my incredibly high-quality beef in the same way uh, when these labeling laws kind of just make it a commodity label. Well, the short answer is no. Yeah, because, because <clears throat> farm programs, farm bills are written by lobbyists and submitted to aides who submitted to their senators, representatives who collect incredible amounts of money from the lobbyists. And big food hires the lobbyists. So, no. They, 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 you know, when I'm asked to help on things like that, I, I try to avoid it because I just, it's just wasting my time. Uh, you know, sadly, the consumer's just got to do his own research, and that's that's. I mean, I know, I know, people don't have the bandwidth for that, mm. but that's that's the option. You know, and it would be better if you could literally go to the farm and shake the hand of the farm. Mm. Now, one thing that has happened that's been a blessing for that is with social media, you can follow a farm. To the point, it's, it's almost like you've been there. Now you need to know you could get. I mean, you need to know the gates open. I mean, we built cabins on this farm for people to come and lodge, built from RV park, because people come here. And then, you know, I bet you there's 
a couple of dozen people on this farm right now that's visiting. And you can come too. And if you, if you, I, I'm not just selling for white oak pasture. No. I'm talking about farms all across the country. If you've got a farm, and I urge you to, to buy locally, as locally as you can. It may not be in your community, but in your state or in your region. You can uh, follow them on social media. Go if you can. But if you can't, follow them on social media. Be sure you know you could go. They do welcome people to come and look. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty good. That's about as good as you're going to be able to do. Absolutely. Yeah, you're reminding me of something that you touched on a couple of minutes ago. You were talking about, <clears throat> you're talking about the, I think, commoditization. You were talking about this race to the bottom when it comes to food that a lot of ranchers and consumers are on the wrong side of, which is such a shame because I feel like as a man or a woman or someone that's high achieving, being able to put pride in your craft is such yeah. an amazing feeling to have. And when we took the tour with you in September, I mean, how many, how many tours do you think you've given here? Thousands? Yeah. And even on the tour that we had had, there's such a pride that you and the team have for everything that you built out here. And it's reflected in the beef and the, the food that you're selling to the local community. And it's such a shame to think that there are, there are farmers or ranchers out there that don't have that feeling. And then I guess the consumer is on the wrong end of that because they're eating a product that's maybe not as nutrient dense or something that shouldn't be grown because there's no seasons anymore. Um, I don't know. It's just an interesting concept to explore. Yeah, something that, one comment to that that you, you would have no way of knowing is that the, the pride exists today. Farmers have pride, but the pride is in efficiency. Mm. You know, the, the, the metric has been efficiency at the expense of everything else. You know, I raised uh, so many pounds of beef on per acre at so much a pound, and that's 3% better than last year, and over the last 20 years, increased 40%. Mm. Uh, it's been efficiency. And then, and well, that was, again, peanuts, cotton, corn. That's what we grow here. Soybeans in the Midwest, avocado, what, what, efficiency, efficiency. And so people have pride, but the pride has been, uh, the target has been moved towards only efficiency, efficiency at the expense of everything else. Mm. And when you, I think, I think that efficiency and resilience are like the antithesis of each other. Mm -hmm. We all need to try to be efficient, but not at the cost of everything else. And the more efficient you make something, the more resilient. You know, mm -hmm. the, the taller you build it, the more likely it is to, to fall, mm -hmm. or the less adversity it can take without fall. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, I was going to say, do you think uh, the pandemic exposed a lot of the over, a, not or I, I guess not thinking about these supply chains, food supply chains in a resilient way, as opposed to what we've just grown accustomed to in terms of efficiency. He did a great job of exposing it for that two weeks. Yeah, <laughs> but people forget. Yeah, you know they, they you know, uh, one morning I was putting on my boots and drinking my coffee, and CNN had the president of Tyson said the food supply chain is breaking. The American food supply chain is breaking. He was right. It was. And if it had lasted longer, mm. you know, it would have been increasingly broken. Mm. So where, where was it breaking most? Was it the processing facilities um, or any other areas that it was really feeling a lot of pressure? Yeah, I think, I think that the, the initial, I think that at all levels, the pain was felt, but the processing was the worst. It was the most, the least resilient. Mm. Of course, when it broke, they started having to euthanize pigs and poultry because they had nowhere to go with them, and, and those animals can't stand there. My cows can stand there for twenty years. Right. But, you know, uh, life. The uh, average life of a cow is expectancy is twenty years. They could have been out there twenty years. It, you know, got older and older. They've been out. Right. But, you know, industrial CAFO feeding operation, you know, those animals, they, they, they got to keep moving. Mm. And you had really protected yourself against that because you have not one but two slaughterhouses on the farm. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. But now one's red meat and one's poultry. So one's red meat and yeah, one's we, poultry. It's really just one for each mm -hmm. you know, animal group. But Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, you know, 
just a very non-resiliency. My, my definition for resiliency is a system that can take a hard licks but continue to operate. Mm. You know, just like we talked about morphing, you know, the, and uh, this, this system is not scaled up to the point that efficiency is everything. Yeah. So there, there is no resilience. Mm. What was your thought process when all of that was happening in that two week month period? And I guess even the months following were you, I'm imagining you were probably feeling relatively insulated from a lot of the other things that farmers were feeling. <laughs> oh shit. We were completely insulated. I, yeah. I wouldn't know we were having a pandemic. Right? <laughs> we, we were kind of a hot spot uh, because, of, because of some social things that occurred, but you know, I got 180 employees. I don't know how many of them actually tested positive at some point, but most most of us, I you know, me and my whole family did. But out of 180 employees, we had zero deaths in one hospitalization that I know of, and that was a a person with a lot of pre-existing stuff. Wow. So, uh, and I'm not I'm not gluten. I mean, it, but but it is a resilient lifestyle, resilient system. It's probably an incredibly interesting position for you to be in because, number one, you're feeling for all the other local farms that are dependent on this True. very delicate supply chain. But number two, it's probably proof, a great proof of concept for you that everything that you've built is... I felt terrible for other people, but, I, but, it, it, but it did make me feel good about the decisions we've made over the mm -hmm. last 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. And, then, and, I, and I, I'll say this. <clears throat> I learned something. Uh, so. The fastest growing part of our business is our own line. As we have lost favor in uh, food service and grocery, uh, the, the own line direct to consumer has, has improved. Mm. And of course, the, during that pandemic panic, it just went crazy. Mm. And you know, we, we can usually keep, I don't really know, a couple of million dollars in inventory, maybe more than that. My daughter could tell you. But <clears throat> all of a sudden, we just sold out of everything. And I got, I was mortified. I have people call me on my cell phone. My cell phone is listed on the website. So I'm easy to get. There. And I've had people call me and say, you know, I've been buying my product from you for X years. You don't have anything. You, you've let me down. Shit. I did. So, you know, we had perfect strangers call here and just order. Huge orders of stuff. And then the people that depended on me, I didn't have anything for them. So uh, <clears throat> we set up a, uh, what was that called? Loyalty program. Mm. So now you're a mayor, what we call it, a councilman, citizen, <laughs> village idiot. <laughs> That's us. Yeah, we'll have to uh, sign up. <laughs> and uh, so we, you know, we protect our people. Yeah, the it's interesting. A lot of the findings you, you said we have short term memories. It's like it does feel like that wasn't all that long ago, but quickly we just go back to the way things uh, were. Yeah, yeah, and, and me too. But, yeah, you know, as a as a species, we suck. You know? <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on, and there's so many things I want to go back to, but you mentioned the greenwashing and. Um, you're very vocal about this one point on one of your blogs. It's it's not just about carbon. There's oh. so many other things going on. I think it's it speaks to how you understand and see what you're doing on this property. It's not just one cycle. It's this whole ecosystem, this whole dance that you're creating between these different worlds. Can you touch on that? Because I think you, you kind of foresee what's coming, which is carbon. This whole carbon argument is going to start being used against people like yourself. Yeah, so I, I told you I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm not, but <laughs> not on, yet. on, that, particular, on <laughs> yeah. that particular topic, maybe so. Yeah. <clears throat> so I told you that industrial farming breaks the cycles of nature, and it does. And the cycles of nature are, to name a few, the carbon cycle, the microbial cycle, the energy cycle, the water cycle, the mineral cycle, and there are there are others. There, I'm. I'm certain there are cycles we don't even recognize. Right. But those cycles, I can see. <clears throat> and you cannot have a healthy ecosystem 
if all the cycles work except one. It doesn't matter. So it's like all your organs work except your heart. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How's that working for you? you know, oh, yeah. Same thing. Just, We'd have to get out of here. <laughs> that's right. Airlift. So, um, it, 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 it's very uh, obvious to me that we talk about the carbon cycle all the friggin' time. Everybody knows about carbon and Ancient carbon and, and the, you know, is it? And, I, and I, I believe that there's going to be a lot of money in the carbon business at some point. And I don't think farmers are going to be uh, going to get much out of it. That, mm-hmm. That's the obvious place to do it. Rebuild this carbon cycle, which builds the soil, which increases productivity, which Makes healthy water, and healthy oceans. Healthy, you just every, we, we can talk about that all day. Yeah. <clears throat> so, is there too much carbon up there? I, I, I bet there is. I mean, they, the scientists say there is. It makes sense to me. Is as many tons and gallons of coal and oil and natural gas as we've pumped out and put up. I don't see how they could not be. Uh, so, the Carbon emitters, people like Delta Airlines and whoever else, is going to be shamed into doing something about it. That's good. That's good. That's fine. Us too, farmers who, you know, if you're helping contribute to that problem, you should be shamed into doing something about it. Shamed through your shareholders, through your customers. So they're going to, you know, at some point, I don't know how it's going to look, they're going to have to pay for carbon emissions. <clears throat> and the people who measure carbon are going to make a lot of money. Mm-hmm. The people who sequester carbon through technology are going to make a lot of money. The people who sequester carbon in the land are going to get left out mm-hmm. for, the, for the greatest part because it's hard to measure. It's much slower. If you're pumping carbon out of the air and pumping it into the ground or putting it in an ingot that you put in a warehouse, that's you're helping solve a problem, but you're not contributing to the betterment of mm. the, the, the the natural system. Mm. So I'm I'm pretty sure I know what's I'm pretty sure I know what that's gonna be. I got friends who farmers who are really watching that very closely. Because they think they're gonna make a lot of money on it. I'm not watching it that close. Not watching it that close. I, I, I certainly take advantage of it if it presented itself. Mm. But I see the technology people hogging that up. Mm. Do you remember when you started to see a strong emphasis being placed on carbon compared to some of these other cycles that you talk about? You know, I don't. It kind of came about gradually. I don't. Gradually. I don't know. I, I, I don't remember that. That. Uh, I, but I have noticed over years that man we're talking about this one problem right and there are other problems yeah and it's a hell of a problem but the others are too yeah Yeah. it's it's interesting it kind of puts you in this interesting position because you're very well known for your life cycle analysis that was done on your land to prove that you are sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere back into the soil and creating organic matter restoring all these systems but then at the same, and I think that's done an amazing job in convincing some people who are skeptical about regenerative farming to start thinking about it in a different way. But now it's like that study could almost start to be used against what you're doing it, yeah. in some ways. Oh, yeah. Well, <clears throat> you know, the, uh, the prop, the, 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 the good thing about sequestering carbon, about putting it in the soil is it's the right thing to do. Yeah. That's a good thing. The bad thing about it is it's hard to measure. Expensive to measure, very slow to accomplish. The, 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 I, I reject the argument that you can only put so much in. I reject that. <clears throat> That's not right. <clears throat> That's junk science. You know, you, I think it has a saturation point that you, depending on your eco, ecosystem, you may only be able to put a certain percentage. Maybe mine's at five point something percent. You know, maybe I'm about there. Maybe it won't get much over six. I don't know. But it can get deeper and deeper. Mm-hmm. 
so I reject the volumetric argument. But the other arguments are valid. It's hard to measure. Mm. The volumetric argument is interesting because there was a panel in September at that Beef Initiative conference that we were at, and I think someone asked you kind of like a – he was almost trying to over-science things. He was asking you how you quantify – carbon or just some of the other regenerative practices that you're implementing here. And I think you very simply said that you go out there with a shovel and based mm -hmm. on what you turn up with the shovel, that's how you kind of quantify what you're doing. Yeah. The LCA, and I, and I know that's not adequate for consumers. Mm -hmm. I know not adequate for government payments. There got to be something better than that. But when that LCA showed that my organic rod and my soil had moved from a half percent to five point something percent, that didn't surprise me. I, I didn't need that eighty thousand dollar LCA to tell me that. I, I can tell it with a shovel. I mean, just just go out there with a the shovel. I can show you right now. Uh, turn a spade full of soil over. It was like chocolate cake. You know, told my neighbors turn a spade full over. And it's a dead mineral medium. Mm. You know, that 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 black stuff in there that causes like chocolate cake. You know what that is? Mm. Carbon. Carbon. And you know where it came from? Up there. Mm. I didn't go to the carbon store and buy any carbon and put it in there. That carbon that's in there used to be greenhouse gas. It came from that plant through the magic of photosynthesis, breathing in that gas carbon, CO2, other greenhouse gases, turning it into liquid carbon, sugar, sucrose, mm -hmm. and then uh, through the magic of that, that plant's growth, turning into solid carbon which is the, the actual plant tissue, roots. and The, the article, the, the, the uh, argument that uh, cows raised naturally are contributing to, to greenhouse gases is such bullshit science. <laughs> do, they, do they burp and flatulate? Yep, they do. Does some carbon go up when they do? Yep, it does. You know where it came from? Up there. You know, all of that carbon came from up there. Mm. Some of it, when the beef that we eat, the level that we wear, the the fat that, that we use in many ways, some of it went into that half percent to five percent, and a, a small percentage of it went back up. It don't matter. It cycles. It's it's cycles. It's a cyclical system. Right. It's, it's not additive. Cycle. Water. You know what it does? Cycles. Minerals. You know what they do? Cycle. Carbon. You know what it does? Cycle. <laughs> Micro. Cycle. It's a cyclical system. It's a living system. It's it's interesting. One, one of the things, we had a conversation with a, a young farmer. He's 30 years old. He has a farm called Counterculture Farms. Uh, his name is Austin, and it's uh, he's in Texas. And uh, one of the things he was talking about was kind of these parallels between what's happening in the soil, what's happening in our food, and what's happening in our communities. It's kind of all being similar where, like, the communications, the natural language that all these different organisms are speaking are, are being broken. And you remind, it reminded me of what you just said about how carbon is going to be potentially used against, uh, you know, farmers like yourself, saying that, you know, Delta Airlines is just going to be able to get carbon credits and uh, just by planting trees, it's like there's this, uh, the incentives just get obfuscated and make us now operate in a way that's not natural. Like it's, why is Delta Airlines able to pump uh, carbon into the atmosphere and then say that it's okay just by planting trees? That doesn't make much sense. Well, the, a couple of things. One is the three systems you mentioned are living systems. That's right. why they're so similar. You know, they're, you're, uh, so... Let's talk about externalized cost because that's what that's with, with the carbon thing. That you yeah, just exactly. That's externalizing cost. And how do we want to talk about that? There's a lot you can say, but uh, you know, we talk about how cheap food is in the industrial system. Well, it's not that freaking cheap. It's just that the costs have been externalized. Uh, you know how much. Uh, how much does a, you know, if you, if you believe in climate change, you believe that weather events come from that, how much does a good hurricane cost society? How much does a, uh, well, those huge fires in the West cost society? Mm. Yeah. How much does uh, 
losing antibiotics that could save your baby because the uh, pathogens are now immune to it. How much does that cost? What does that cost society? Billions, what? trillions. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, more. <laughs> so limited. Yeah. You know, we, we can go on ex- ex- species extinction. How many species have been lost of plants, animals, micro? Now, what does that cost society? And we, we can go on and on. I, I, I bet you I can make a list <laughs> that cost society, but it doesn't cost the perpetrator. It didn't, and I've been a perpetrator. Mm-hmm. Right? That dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, how much that cost society? Well, I contributed to it. Yeah. I put a bunch of pesticides, chemical fertilizer out on my land. It went down Spring Creek to the Apalachicola River to the Apalachicola Bay. You know what you can't do in Apalachicola Bay anymore? Harvest oysters. Mm-hmm. How much that cost society? So, and when you talk about, uh, I see, I see advertisement for a whole chicken fryers, a dollar a pound. Shit. <laughs> Ground beef, two dollars and a half a pound or something. Shit. Those, they're huge externalized cost in those cheap ass prices. Yeah. The society's paid. Mm. So, you know, don't, don't talk to me about that. Yeah. yeah. What's interesting too a lot of these perpetrators seem like they're continuing to get off scot-free and you have a very interesting perspective. You wrote that great blog on um, the recipients for the USDA. What was it? Yeah. The Climate Smart Commodities yeah. Grant? Cli- the Climate Smart Commodity Grant. And we, we put together a, uh, a, a proposal that I thought was really good about grazing uh, solar huge, these big, Utility size, solar arrays. We graze two now, and they're going to be grazing some more as time goes on. They're big. One of them's uh, 680 acres. One of them's 450 acres. And the other two would be nearly 1,000 acres each. Big. And it's a great opportunity for underserved people to, to get into farming. I mean, I, I'm not an underserved person, mm. but I'm, a, I'm in a position to figure it out and, and do it. And we wanted to teach other people, so I, we did a, hired a, a lady who's very talented to do the grant application for us. I felt very good about it. And I got my letter saying that my, our grant had been rejected, and I said, well, shit, you know, there must be some good ones. You know, that's spill milk. I no problem. I, I've lost before. I, ain't, I, you know, I don't have to win all the time. Then the announcement came out. <laughs> And the, the recipients were people like PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, big restaurant chains, Microsoft, Microsoft. Google, John Dell. I mean, just you, you can look at it. It's, it's online. That's where I got it. And uh, and that pissed me off. You know, it's, it's just, you know and, it's, and it gets back to that lobbyist, aides, politicians, you know, making these kinds of decisions. Yeah, to, to what you said is it wasn't losing the grant that pissed you off. You've lost things before. You're a big boy. It's who they're giving the grants oh, to. Yeah. I think you had said like the exact actors that are fucking up the, uh, the, the environment are the ones that are receiving the grants. Yeah. Oh, if some other farmer got it because he had a better proposal than me, shit, that's fine. That's fine. How can I help you? But Did they give you any qualifications as to why you didn't get it? Or was it just... Just a no. I think there was some process I could go through yeah. to get it reviewed. You know, I ain't fucking with that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I already knew why. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's one of those things that's that's hard to as a as someone who wants to see this regenerative agriculture movement continue to move in the right direction. It's hard to see more money getting steered in the wrong direction towards these companies that don't really have anything uh, to to offer, you know, small farmers, medium yeah. sized farmers, um, other than, you know, just continuing more of the same. Well, what, what wounded me about it is the fact it was just such stark evidence that I, I just, how screwed up this whole thing is. Right. You know, you, you know climate smart commodity grant <laughs> to the very perpetrators that screwed up. And I, I'm, a, I'm a perpetrator too. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not, this is not wholly of them now, but you know, the, uh, the project we submitted 
was about there's no way of of questioning the benefit to society, rural America, underserved farmers, people that want to eat uh, good food, mm. you know, on and on. Yeah. So, and this and, was, and again, the, that's that's old, man, but I, I but. It's not spilled milk. We ain't crying over spilled milk. We just use this as an example to help people understand how bad things are. Hmm. What is your perspective on um, just the USDA overall? <laughs> That's a loaded question. Which I know is a loaded question. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, no, I'm litigating against them right now. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, but let's, let's, let's just be clear here. To say USDA is good or bad, that's like saying people in New York City are good and bad. Certainly, there are wonderful people in USDA. Certainly, there are. Certainly, there are horrible people in USDA. Certainly, there are. And the, the system is the system is just not good. You know, I, you know, one thing I believe is that there's a uh, like a revolving door policy. I don't think it's just USDA. I think it's the federal bureaucracy. I believe there are people in the Department of Defense. Let's talk about them that become very senior and they're 50 years old and been making a hundred and something thousand dollars a year as senior administrators. And I think those people, there's a culture there where they kowtow to the defense industry and, and, and rule in their favor and buy preferentially, no kickbacks. But then when those guys retire at 52, they can go to work with that Defense Department making $300,000 a year. I think that happens. And I think it happens in USDA and other bureaucracies. Mm. I can't prove it, and I don't want to get sued, but I, do I believe things like that happen? Oh, yeah. Mm. That's what I believe. Mm. But for you to operate your slaughterhouses, it has to be, is it a USDA certified facility? Is that what the, the labeling is Inspected. called? Inspected. 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 Now, that's that's a little different. So we'll talk about that. Okay. All right, so... Uh, USDA uh, catches a lot of hell that I don't think they deserve on that deal. I, I told you, this is good and it's bad, right? So uh, the fact is there are onerous food safety rules that processing plant owners have to, you know, regulations we have to follow, this USDA administers. And, and, they, and, and I use the word onerous, and, and I mean it. They're onerous. They're hard to do. But every one of those regulations are in place because somebody somewhere did something stupid or criminal. You know, food safety is important. So while it has cost me a lot of money and time and effort and anguish in the last 20 years uh, following these onerous regulations, there's a reason for it. Now, that's just true. The uh, What they're criticized for is the fact that these regulations are easier to comply with for big industrial plants than us, us small plants. And and I, I think I think that's just part of that efficiency. That that I mean, it's just you know, it's so easy to uh, so much easier to comply when you got a big mm. high volume plant. If nothing yeah. else, you got more head to amortize the cost over. Mm. Right. So we we can talk about that a lot. Got yeah. it. We had a conversation with Joel Salton, and he I think the words that he used was uh, cost uh, pre- prejudicial or or size prejudicial. When it comes to the just um, ability to compete against some of the bigger processing facilities, I, I can understand him using that word. I, I wouldn't argue with that. Yeah. But I also, uh, I don't want food safety to become less stringent. Right. I mean, that, that, that's, mm. that's bad for everybody. Yeah. And one of the few, you know, one of the few benefits of the uh, mega industrial slaughter is the fact that uh, it, it is so efficient for the for the people that own it, but it also makes it efficient for USDA. Mm-hmm. And 
and that winds up being prejudicial against us. But I can't say that's intentionally prejudicial. Right, right. There's some things. I believe that that grant thing, I believe that's intentionally prejudicial. <laughs> intentionally right. prejudicial. These other things, I think, are just organically a little mm -hmm. pre pre prejudicial. Do you yeah. have a perspective on that whole Amos Miller trial that's going on with him versus the USDA? I don't. I know about it, but I don't know enough about it. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, without me studying up more, you know, I really hate to comment on that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you could remind me. The only it. thing I know is that I, I guess he's an Amish farmer in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and he's got a private membership association. I think it's four thousand members that have been buying meat, raw milk products like that from him for. For decades, and I think he's in some type of a lawsuit against the USDA because I guess he is, his members are buying from him because he's selling food as God intended. So I don't think he's spraying it with, I don't know if it's citric acid or something that no. needs to make it USDA certified. So the USDA has been coming after him, and I guess uh, it's just been getting a lot of coverage. Yeah, you know, I, I don't, I don't know that story well. I've heard okay. of it. I don't know enough well to comment. I'm not, I'm not reluctant to comment. I just don't know enough. Yes. You know, I, I personally drink raw milk that is labeled for pet food only mm -hmm. because in Georgia, you can't sell raw milk for human consumption. So, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of involving myself in that sort of commerce. <laughs> but I, uh, here we don't do it simply because I, I don't dairy and the things that I, I do do a lot of further processing. But it's, it's pretty easy for us, you know, to, to, and, and I don't know the scale that guy operates on. I just don't know. I don't know enough. You don't know enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know enough about that. It is an interesting world that we live in, though, where you can go buy Fruity Pebbles from any grocery store and in any state. And raw milk, it's depending on where you live, you can't even get access to this yeah. incredibly nutrient dense form of food <laughs> yeah. that we've been eating for thousands oh, I mean, of years. I was first to talk about how screwed up food laws are now. Yeah. One, uh, uh, Brad had a chance to mention the grant, um, which hits on a topic I was hoping to talk to you about, which is subsidies and just money in general in food because it's such a limiting factor or, uh, you know, in the opposite case, I think it, it can provide a lot of opportunities for people who um, maybe need to have a little bit of extra money to grow their farm operation. And access to money is obviously massive for farming. It's incredibly t capital intensive business. Um what do you, or what is your opinion of the subsidies in the U.S. now? Like, are those promoting the types of practices that you want to see into the future? No, that's something I know a lot about. <laughs> Let's <Yeah>. talk. <laughs> uh, so I think that uh, the only place in my life that I know I'm a hypocrite is government money. You know, I, I, I think it's wrong. It's bad. But it's, maybe my crop says it. I think it's wrong. I think it's bad. I think most frequently... They subsidize the wrong things, but I'm the first to sign up, and I'm very competitive. I get under the gold with my elbow. <laughs> you know, I, I mentioned Gabe Brown. Uh, uh, Gabe won't accept government money, mm. and I respect that. Uh, I tell him that, you know, bro, I, I'm just more of a whore than you are, <laughs> and I am, because I'll take it. I think it's wrong, mm. but if they're going to give it away, I'm going to take it. My, my my line is, if I were king, there wouldn't be any. Yeah. But they won't let me be king. <laughs> so I do, the, the disclaimer is I sign up for everything. Now, the truth is, uh, as I said before, big ag and big food write the farm bill through lobbyists, through staffers, through the politicians that actually vote on it, or debate it and vote on it. That's just the way it is. Mm. It's not new. I, we can talk a lot about that. You know, the, the most, I'm, you probably won't cut this out because it's, it's, it's probably just interesting to me, but <laughs> the most highly subsidized crops historically were southern crops. Tobacco, sugar, rice, cotton, peanuts. Historically. That's mm. changed a little bit, but from way back. But why is that? And the answer is because the South had an agrarian economy. And separately, the South inherited elected uh, politicians for life. You know, the Talmadges, the Russells, mm -hmm. they stayed. Strom Thurmond was the most recent. 
when you got in, when you became a, a representative or a senator from from the South, you, you you're probably gonna be there twenty or thirty or forty years. Well, how do they make committee assignments? Seniority. What committees did those Southern politicians want to serve on? Ag. So the 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 farm bill was built by Southern leadership. Mm. And and it was it was like pork, pork pork barrel politics, right? You know, they they subsidized those southern crops most heavily, and that's evolved. But now it's today it's not driven by southern politicians. It's driven by big ag and big food, mm. hiring lobbyists, telling the staffers what to write. So that's that's the way that works. So it it's, it's a bad program, huge. Huge program. It's not good. Mm. And it, it also is what I find interesting. I think I've heard the statistic. It's like 60% of monocropped or industrialized cropped uh, agriculture gets fed into feedlot agriculture. So it's, I don't know if that's 100% accurate, but if that's the case, it's kind of perpetuating this system that directly competes with what you're doing. Yeah, I don't know what the percentages are, but to be sure. Uh, the money in that, for the most part, is spent is decided by big ag and big food. Now, there's some window dressing. There's some mm. little things on there. We, one would have believed that climate smart commodity grant would have been one of those, but would, mm. it, it even went back to big multinational companies. Right? right. How does the process actually work to receive subsidies for some of those crops that you mentioned? It's uh, it's done through a branch of USDA called FSA, Farm Services Agency. And uh, used to be every county had an FSA office. They've consolidated some, so now there's, there's less of them. But it's a, it's a bureaucratic process. The program is announced. You sign up. I sign up. Gabe don't sign up. Mm-hmm. But uh, and you... We, we, we get subsidies. We take subsidies. Mm. Uh, to your point, I get subsidized less per dollar volume I do than probably a, a, a commodity, a monocultural commodity product, uh, farmer, probably. I don't, I hadn't, I hadn't done that arithmetic, but I'm sure it's true. Mm. One of the things that I, th- I think you mentioned this on the Joe Rogan podcast was that, um, you don't grow all of your cow feed on property. Is that right? I grew just about all my cow feed on property. The cow feed is, is hay. Yeah. Or hay. And most of it's grown on this property. You know, sometimes we run out and we'll buy some from a neighbor. Right. Uh, I do not buy, I do not grow my monogastric feed, the pig, pig and poultry feed. I buy it and I don't like that, but I do. You know, yeah. I love closing loops. Hmm. You know, the more things I can do for myself, the more resilient. It may not make us more money, but it makes us more resilient. Right. Not being dependent upon. I don't have my own hatchery. I buy chicks and keats and ducklings and goslings from a hatchery, but I want one. Hmm. You know, I've spent my last 25 years closing loops. There's still a lot of them to be closed. Some of them, some of them you know, won't be closed by me. Hmm. Do you think it's important to make that effort to eat pork and chicken that are non-corn and soy fed? Because that's something that a lot of people on the internet are talking about. And I'm just curious your perspective actually raising and slaughtering animals like that. The, you know, that's, that's outside the land <laughs> uh, community mm-hmm. animal program. Uh, but I hear it too. And in fact, we feed, I may get this wrong, but I'm going to try it. We feed our pigs, non-GMO feed that we buy. Mm. We feed our poultry, non-corn, non-soy, which is non-GMO feed. And we do that out of customer demand. You know, our customers have talked to my daughter who's marketing and convinced her that that's what they want. And so we... Uh, have invested in, in, and we've increased our cost of doing business by buying those feeds. And they cost more, and it takes longer. Mm. And, and I, you know, the, the nutrition side of it, you know, I don't know. 
I, I, don't, I don't know all that. Got it. But uh, it's based off of customer demand. Because okay. purely customer demand. Now, I say this about GMOs. Uh, it's important for me to say this. The, uh, the damage that's been done by industrializing farm production, agriculture, farming, it's been through the misuse of technology. Misapplied technology. You know, how many pesticides have been recalled? We talked about right. nitrogen and phosphate runoff. Oh, no, no. Uh, you could take it to pharmaceuticals that have been recalled. So, so just, it's just misused technology. Uh, GMOs, as far as I know, don't cause any any problems. Now, that chemical fertilizer, as far as my dad knew, didn't cause any problems. Right. So, you know, is there a likelihood that GMOs are misused technology? Well, if history's a guide, it is. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know that. You know, do I mistrust them? Hell yeah. I mean, it's something that is that technology that is that powerful. Take genes out of a salmon and put it in a plant. I mean, that's Unheard of. And we've only been doing it since, what, the 80s? Probably. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's so new. And and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if my grandchildren aren't sitting here talking about the horrible damages of that misapplied technology. But I, I don't know that. I just know if history's a guide, it's probably true. Mm-hmm. Now, does it, using that non-GMO and non-corn, non-soy, does that add the cost of production? Yep. They call it feed costs more, and they don't. It takes longer for them to reach market weight. Is it worth it? My daughter thinks it is. So mm-hmm. That's what we're going to do. Interesting. Yeah, I was. I was going to ask. You, you kind of answered the question, but is closing these loops becoming harder because the uh, the agricultural system is more centralized, uh, meaning? A lot of like the genetics uh, out there is the chemicals are just in so few people's hands that it's like almost, is it hard to do your own way of uh, things just completely separate from them? Yeah, I don't think, I don't think I I would make that statement. Uh, I don't think it's hard for me to close loops uh, necessarily because of, uh, because of that. But what that does make me want to tell you is uh, I want, let's talk about this is back on that externalized cost a little bit mm. um, let me see how to get into that uh, alright let's do this so USDA every year uh, publishes a, a number that's uh, the uh, how, what percent of the food dollar the farmer gets and it's been coming down for a long time. And I think it's something like 14.3 or 0.7 cents today. And uh, and when you hear that initially, you know, you, you, call, you call bullshit on that. That's not right. The guy that's, or girl that's raising the animal or vegetable or grain ought to be getting a lot more than 14.3 or 7 cents of every dollar. Oh, well, yeah. You gotta break that down a little bit. Uh, you'll never hear me say anything that sounds like I'm defending big ag or big food. If it sounds like I'm defending it, I said it wrong. You heard it wrong. I don't defend <clears throat> them. We're talking about big tobacco in a minute. But the fact is, uh, big ag and big food have absorbed a tremendous amount of the cost that the farmer used to bear, or that, that, that we bear here, and farmers in general used to bear. You know, if you're a farmer, anywhere in the 48 states, I'll leave Alaska and Hawaii out because I don't know anything about it, but in 48 states, and you raise a load of any commodity, a 48,000-pound, 18-wheeler truck load of any commodity, whether it's pigs or corn or tomatoes or avocados or... It don't matter. Raise that peaches. Raise that 
48,000 pounds, you can call Big Ag, and they'll come get it and give you a check, and it's over for you. Mm. You don't have to worry about getting it processed. You don't have to worry about um, market access. You don't have to worry about getting it to them. You just call and tell them where the truck is. They'll, they'll come get it, and you get an EFT or, or check. Mm -hmm. So they have absorbed those costs, but it came at a great price to mm. the farm. And those prices, that's what we talked about previously, the mm. fact that the uh, impact to the community, to the environment, to the consumer is also externalized. So it seems like almost to have the sovereignty that you have, you have to be willing to bear that cost that Big Ag Whew. is Absolutely. bearing and have that skin in the game. Absolutely. That, 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 I, I've never said it that way before, but that's good. To have the sovereignty that we enjoy comes at a great cost. Mm. You know, for years, the office for the farm was the kitchen table. And when I built my first plant, the red meat plant, in 07, I built the first office we ever had. It was a little 12 by 12. It was my office. We never had office before. I thought I was a big shot. <laughs> I recently built an administration building to house the people it takes to handle that sovereignty that you brought up. I'm going to remove that sovereignty. Sovereignty. <laughs> but, you know, we went from being a tiny little component in the big food chain that feeds us all to being our own tiny little food chain. Tiny little food chain. $25 million a year in a multi-trillion dollar industry. Mm. So when we do that, then we we uh, we pay that price. Mm. But then we get to decide to close the loops and those kinds of things. That, that it's not going to be a race to the bottom. It would be so interesting just to see your dad's reaction to the concept of you having an office and an admin team and just the sovereignty and the whole facility that you've that you've built out here. I think of it every fucking day. Every day. He uh <clears throat> so my dad was an only child born in nineteen twenty. And I'm an only child born in nineteen fifty four. That's very unusual for farm families mm. of those generations. And uh <clears throat> he was a child of the depression and just so debt uh uh, adverse, you know, wouldn't borrow money. I think he like everything we've done except borrowing money. But uh, you know, when, when I die and go to hell, he's gonna be there waiting on me. <laughs> and I dread it. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, I dread it. Uh, are you encouraged by what you're seeing within this this new age of of agriculture that's slowly sprouting up? Uh, you've you know really pioneered it, but are you encouraged by the direction of how things are going? <clears throat> That's a good question, and I am. But now, I cannot honestly tell you right now whether I am a niche producer raising food for the sophisticated consumer that cares about the land and the community and their body, or whether I am an early innovator in a change. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I fear I'm just a niche producer. That's what I fear. Mm. And I, the, 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 the question becomes, what percent of the people care enough to re-internalize those externalized costs? And I don't know. I don't, you, know, I, you know, I don't know what it is now, but I don't think it's much, 2 or 3%. Mm. Uh, you know, we sell $25 million worth of stuff. That's a lot. Mm. But we, we, we sell it in 48 states. You know, I, I don't want to do that. I want to sell 25. I don't want to sell 35 million. I want to sell 25 million. Mm. And I want to sell it right here in Georgia, Florida, Alabama. Mm. I want somebody else doing it in those other places. Yeah. But I, I don't know what percent. I don't know. I don't know what percent. I know there's, there's a, a huge percentage of the people that are absolutely addicted to obscenely cheap food. <laughs> and they're never coming this way. Yeah. I know there are people. At least people enough to buy twenty five million dollars worth, and it's not just me. You know, Gabe's selling it, <laughs> Alexandra is selling it, and Gunthorpe is selling it, and Richards is selling it. 
So, you know, I don't, I don't know how much we're selling, but, you know, a few hundred million dollars. I bet, I bet you, if we're selling 25 million, then we are. I bet you it's not a few hundred million. It's all that's sold in this country. Mm. It's small. I'm talking about the real deal. The real deal. And, you know, how, I mean, I, that, what percentage is that? Probably one yeah. or less. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't know whether, I don't know whether you would know better than I do. Yeah, you talk to those people. You are those people. Yeah. I don't know, I don't know where the lines are. Yeah. Trying, trying to grow the percentage, but it seems like the audience of people is, that are receptive are very passionate about it which is a hard thing to, t to take away and, and take lightly. I think people who are excited about this movement are, probably aren't going to change their mind. And your nemesis is the incredible advertising budget of big food. Mm -hmm. yeah. or they, or they, they, are, they got brilliant people <laughs> paying them a lot of money to convince them that something greenwashed is just as good as me and those people I just listed are doing. Mm-hmm. So, and, and it's effective. Yes. It's, it's great. Yeah. A stat that we come back to is, so the average child watches almost three hours of television on the average day, and, <laughs> which, is, which speaks for Not itself. often. Yeah. <laughs> and during the three hours time, they'll be shown 23 ads for food that's high in sugar and fat. How about that? Is that incredible? That's incredible. Yeah. We didn't have a TV till I was pretty good sized no. kid. <laughs> you turned well, out all right. <laughs> well, and that, that's their informational diet. And then you, you go look at the food and it's, you know, as soon as it hits their tongue, they're addicted to what they're seeing on the TV. And then it hits their tongue and they're addicted to the, the taste mm -hmm. of the, those highly processed foods. It's really this beautifully orchestrated system. Um, you know, I, I use the term uh, predatorial marketing. I mean, I think that it's, it's really dangerous having that, that uh, tactic of being able to just target kids. Well, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't know what kids are like today, but you know, when, in my era, it'll, it'll, all all young boys, all young men wanted to be athletes and superstars, and, and what was on the cover of, if it wasn't a cartoon character, what was mm -hmm. on the cover of that that cereal box or the poster? Was, right. Yeah. Um, We've mentioned legacy a few times, and we were uh, we were excited to get down here because in September because it was right around the time that the sixth generation of uh, white oak pastures was being born. Do you think about you know just into the future, sort of how things are being handed off um, to your daughters, and and then uh, the sixth generation as well? Yeah, I got seven grandchildren. Two were born this year. Okay, so, congratulations uh, by the way. Thank you. Appreciate that. So. Uh, you, you know, it's important to me that my, so, so ironically, my dad did not want me to come back and farm. Mm. I mean, we, we were like this for a lot of time. That's what I want to do. He didn't want me to do it. He had his own reason. Um, and I never thought my children were coming back. You know, my, my, they had three daughters, and they were raised like uh, suburban kids. They were raised out in the country, but, you know, it was, uh, they, they never drove a tractor. You know, the, they, uh, you know, they went to ballet and karate and soccer and piano and voice. You know, they were just like suburb kids. I never thought they'd come back here. And, uh, you know, what I wanted to do is create them an opportunity to come back, but not the obligation to come back. Mm. And, you know, no family business lasts for many generations. I mean, I used to point out the Cargill but most seldom does a family business go for more than what three, four, five, six generations, and this one won't either. I, mean, I don't know exactly what, what day, but at what generation? But sooner or later, somebody just won't want to do it anymore, and that's I can't I, I can't run it from the grave. Mm. Uh, now I am doing all I, I do have two of my three dollars that are committed to it. So, you know, they are in their 30s, and so, and they're very deeply committed, and their spouses are. So there's no doubt in my mind, this farm, uh, unless we hit some economic uh, insurmountable problem, will go on for another 30 years. Mm. 
and we make our investments generational. One of the things that is a blessing and a curse is uh, we can we make decisions generationally. We don't we don't pay much attention to a quarterly report or an annual report. We don't have much money, cash to spend. We got a lot of assets. We don't have much money, and we got a lot of projects we want to do. And when we're considering those projects, we don't think about it having to pay itself off in a year or five years. You know, if it, we, we think about it in a 30-year window. To be sure, we're going to operate another 30 years. Right. With seven grandchildren, there's a likelihood one or two or more. We want to, that's another 30 years. Mm. So sooner or later it'll end. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know how that looks. I don't know how that works. Mm. Uh, in the meantime, what we're focused on is an orderly secession. Now, I've had, uh, I'm 68 years old, and I've seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of shit. I've seen a lot of great family businesses that just, just went to hell when daddy died because nobody knew what to do. And we're not going to let that happen. Mm. And there's a, uh, a secession plan. You know, and, and my, my uh, family members and non-family members who are in management are very involved in the decision-making process. So it took a long, I bought a, yesterday, uh, I bought a, a, a little mobile home and 1.5 acres of land for $35,000. And I, I went to the board and asked for permission to do it. It was my damn money. <laughs> but I don't do that anymore. And now we make decisions as a group. Mm. What is the feeling like for you when you go to different conferences or more so have people come out to the farm and they talk to you about the impact that you and White Oak have had on them in terms of their appreciation for good food or regenerative farming practices? Well, it is flattering, Mm -hmm. but now I don't want to be a hypocrite. I have done nothing for anybody except myself and my family. You know, uh, any benefit that came, that's great. I'm glad it helped. But now, I don't want to be that guy that says, well, I just wanted the best for the community. And that's not the way that was. Mm-hmm. I, I was making self-serving, now, not to the expense of anybody else, but self-serving decisions. How's this going to look for me? Mm-hmm. So I don't want to be a, I'm, I'm pleased that if, if we benefited others, I'm pleased we did. Mm-hmm. But I'm not that, I'm not that self-serving or that, uh, I am self-serving. I'm not one of those options. There's, there's something to that. Uh, no, you're sorry. Good. I was just going to say there's something to that. We've spent a lot of time in the car the past few days and just having conversations like that around this, just the very nature of kind of taking care of your own house or your, your you know, your, your own self and just the externalities of that is generally positive for everyone who comes into contact with you. Well, I hope, I mean, some people will probably say not. Right. You know, I've, I've fired people. I've put people in jail. I've sued people. You know, that's, that people would not agree with you. But, yeah. You know, but we we try to do. I, I think a good deal has got to be a good deal for everybody. Mm. I mean, it's got to be good for me, the employee, and the customer. So yeah. if you do that, you minimize the people that you have to fire or sue or put in jail or, mm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. Beat it, up. Beat up. Sometimes they steal guns from me, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Um, is your wife very proud of everything that you all have built oh, out I here? Think, oh, she's so proud. Her babies came home. And, <laughs> yeah. And, and she enjoys. My wife has never been uh, actively involved in the business. Uh, she's been a uh, con- uh, school teacher, educator, consummate mother, consummate grandmother. Never been actively involved in the management of the business. I'm certainly very interested in it, mm-hmm. and and uh, uh, it's benefited. You know, we, like I said, we got uh, five grandchildren here on the farm, mm-hmm. and two children here on the farm, and that's that's a blessing. It's mm-hmm. such a blessing, and the fact that you gave them the opportunity to, where you said in best case scenario, they'll all three of them will and, come back. And one did, and one, one did not to, yeah. because you gave them the choice to be able to well, do that. Yeah, I mean, she, she could do what she wanted. To. I, I certainly wouldn't want to. Mm-hmm. For you. Um, what are you personally the most proud of with everything that you've built out here? Probably, probably my children coming back. Mm. Yeah. What sort of things do you want them to take away from what you've done? You know, 
hear over the past several decades through your working with your father and, and then through to today? What sort of things do you want them to really stand behind and, and be proud of as they continue to grow what you've built? Well, you know, those are personal decisions for them to make. But I feel like the, uh, the com- you know, again, the community, the land, the animals, it's, it's where it's at for us. Yeah. And, and the synergy that benefits uh, us and uh, happily others, but, you know, for us. You know, I tell people that, you know, if, if I give a man a job, a personal job, and they say thank you, I say, you got to thank me. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. I say, if I give you something I don't want, you ain't got to say thank you. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. Well, we can definitely feel there, there's a certain, um, it's like energy or power to to being out here. And it's, you can listen to what we're talking about right now, but it's, you don't get it until you fully come out here and see you give the tour and see the animals and see your family and just see the impact that you're having on the community. And I genuinely mean this. It's something that Harry and I want to say, you've had a tremendous impact on both of us. I know you were buying your beef from White Oak Pastures. We've read countless blogs that you've written about and there are many other people that we're friends with that you've had a huge impact on. So just for us, knowing that we started this show um, in March, we'd had corporate jobs. We'd quit them because we really wanted to go all in on this concept of building something from scratch and teaching people about food, getting to sit down with you. It's just an unbelievable feeling and a blessing and just right. appreciate you more than you know. Well, thank you. That's very kind and, and heartening to hear. But uh, again, you thank him for something I didn't do for you. <laughs> <laughs> I did that for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I'm, I'm very glad of any benefit that comes from it. But what, what I what I want to say about what you just said is, <clears throat> this is back on that deal about being scalable versus replicatable. You know, it, it, if what we did here is special, it's so replicatable. Mm. This was done by a C student from the University of Georgia College of Agriculture. <laughs> you know, uh, with... And I had, uh, economically, I had a, 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 I inherited a farm that I could leverage, but no trust fund, mm. you know, no, no Bill Gates deal. So highly replicatable. You can, you know, if it's good, that's good. Let's do it again and again and again and again. And these people that are doing it are not my competitors. You know, I want to help them. Right. Yeah, it's it's inspiring to see what you've done out here. And just the message, too, is great. I mean, the idea i think everyone uses that word scale as the like the big question uh yeah. with regenerative ag it's, and i think you just you kind of hit the nail on the head with we just need more people to be inspired by this message and go out and start doing some of the work themselves you know one of the first things the scale is it's, it's a hard word to use and i use it because i want to differentiate between this versus big ag big food right but uh <clears throat> we have a lot of people that that come here and want a homestead. And I think, which is super small scale, I think that's fine. I think that's great. I tell them, this is not the best place to learn it. Because I, you know, I've, I've never, uh, you know, I've never uh, planted a garden. You know, mama used to make me work in the garden a little bit, and I hated it every day. <laughs> uh, and I never milked a cow I made butter. I milked a a cow that had mastitis, I need to get the, the infection out. But, mm. You know, this is not the place to come to learn homesteading, although I, I respect it and I support it. Uh, certainly this is not the place to come to learn big industrial farm. You know, there, there are, you know, and it's not linear. It's not homesteading where we do big industrial farm. Spatially, it's out here on the table. It's mm. different. Right. Very different. You seem like you very humbly know the things that you're good at versus what's not in your skill set, and you'll tell people that. Well, I'm arrogant enough to <laughs> talk about what I'm good at, mm. and I've had my nose rubbed in the shit enough to know what I'm not good <laughs> at. Mm-hmm. So. Awesome. Well, just echoing what Brett said, our butts would not be in this seat if it wasn't for you. So just appreciate everything you've done here, and uh, thanks for your amazing hospitality down here for this uh, day that we've been down here and the time that we spent in September. It was really special for us to get down here. So well, thank you for making you. the long trip from Austin twice. And I hope you'll do it uh, again and again and again. Always welcome. That's the plan. Thank you. All right. Thank awesome. you.